everlasting Father, we come before you and we ask for you to watch over us and guide us. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Look upon us with mercy and grace. Bless this day. Bless this ministry time. Watch over our teacher far away in a foreign land. Bring him home safe. Lord, guide us today. Guard our spirits. Let us open our ears and hearts to hear the message. Walk us through what we need to know in our lives today, Lord. We ask you to be with us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right, everybody. I'd like to introduce to you Weston Fouché from Seattle's Union Gospel Mission, giving us our message today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's so great to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Weston, and uh, just by way of connection, uh, I don't know if this makes me sound young or if it makes Dan sound old, but he's not here to defend himself, so I'll tell the story anyway. Uh, I've, had, I've known Dan since I was probably uh, 10 or 11 years old. I was at Bible Baptist Church in Auburn, and uh, was a part of the youth ministry, and Dan stepped in for a season when we were between youth pastors. And uh, So anyway, I've known him all the way back to our days at Bible Baptist before he left to plant church. And I uh, spent the last 30 years doing pastoral ministry here in Southeast King County at several different churches, mostly in youth ministry, but in missions and outreach, local outreach, men's ministry, connections, all kinds of stuff. And then two years ago, the Lord called me out of local church ministry to come work for the mission. And my role at the mission is to work with local churches. Um, our hope is to help the local church have a gospel response to homelessness. And so after spending some time with Dan and talking a little bit about what we're doing to equip the local church, he asked if I would come and to share with you this morning. So today is going to be a training. It's maybe less than a, 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 a not necessarily a sermon, right? It's a, it's a training and equipping opportunity for you. Um, but I'm hopeful that what you hear today will be transformative in your thinking about what God is doing in our community. Uh, so this is called Engaging Homelessness 101, uh, an overview of homelessness and the path to restoration. And, uh, uh, you know, my personal connection to homelessness, several different people that I knew, uh, that I know who in their adult life, I knew them as kids growing up in the church, but in their adult life found themselves addicted to drugs, um, ended up losing their family and their jobs and, and on the streets. And one of these gentlemen uh, was living in the woods near his home, his childhood home, and somebody gave me a heads up that this was happening to him. And uh, I, I engaged with him, had a conversation with him about what was happening in his life, and was able to support him for a time. Uh, praise God, right? Uh, through uh, the relationship with God's church, uh, he's completely restored. Full-time employment, re-engaged with his family, permanent housing, uh, restored to the Lord and following the Lord. And all of that critical component to support system for him moving through that journey over a number of years was his connection to a local church and a body of Christ that that didn't give up on him and wanted to help him um, find restoration in his life. And so just really committed to the fact that God wants to use the local church to restore lives. And, uh, and so, you know, our training, you know, what we're going to do today, we want you to leave today having a better understanding of the homelessness crisis in the greater Seattle area and, and how we as the church can be a part of that, as, as God's solution, right? It's our prayer that between our presentation and your questions that you'll be leaving uh, feeling better informed and equipped, and you'll be inspired, motivated, open to the Spirit's call to care for and love our homeless and hurting neighbors. So we want to start with a video clip. This kind of sets the stage for the crisis in our community. Take a look at this crisis headlines video. Pump that sound. Give it some volume. What if Seattle is dying and we don't even know it? of illegal drug use can be found in vacant lots in people's backyards. A box full of used needles. The guy who put this up told me that in the first four days after he put up the box for the first time, there were 500 used needles. Just give them some assistance today. It'll keep them out of our shelter system. It'll keep them out of tents and out of vehicles. But of course, what is happening in King County and on the streets of Seattle isn't about dollars. It's about human lives. How could this be the way? Father God, we know that your heart is for those who are broken and that your desire is to bring restoration 
uh, for those who are hurting in our community. Uh, Father, we're grateful that you use your church, that your plan A on planet Earth is to use you, the body of Christ, to bring the message of hope and restoration, the message of the kingdom that transforms into the lives of those who are hurting in our communities. And so we pray that you'd equip us today, that you'd help us to see the way you see, that you would help us to, as we step out of here today, to live and take action in the way that you would have us uh, to demonstrate your incredible love and this truth that you are always a God of hope. And so uh, we just give you this next time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, before I dive into the heart of the training, I want to say a couple of things. First, the missions approach has really evolved over the years. Today, we take a much more relational approach than previously. And what do we mean by that? Well, we see the unhoused not as homeless, but as our homeless neighbors. We meet them and we greet them with smiles and handshakes and hugs. We know their names and we use their names when we talk to them. We know more than 4,000 of our homeless neighbors by name, and that number is growing every day. We listen and we learn their stories. We want everybody to know, right? We want everybody that we meet that they, to know that they are not statistics, that they're people. They're made in the image of God, and they're worthy of dignity, and that's how we treat them. We're proactive in our approach. About a decade ago, we started sending teams out to encampments to meet and care for and build relationships with our homeless neighbors, so we're able to get to know them before they come to us. Uh, the second thing is this. Even with all of our history and experience, you've got to understand that it's overwhelming for us at times, too. We know we don't have all the answers, and we don't pretend that we do. Homelessness is a complicated issue. Science has taught us a lot over the years uh, about childhood trauma and its effects on our adult lives. And uh, as we look at uh, working with our homeless neighbors, we're constantly learning, but we're learning on the front lines. And it's not easy to be on the front lines, and our staff and volunteers to go some some of the very dark places in our community. We just see despair and homelessness. We see squalor and filth that really would leave the most jaded person speechless. The things we see and hear impact us and our teams that are on the street deeply. So we need your prayers to keep going and do the work that God's called us to do. We invite the local church to stand with us in prayer for those who are actively engaged with our homeless neighbors on the street. The third thing I want to say is that the mission, since it started in 1932, since it started in 1932, the mission, right, the gospel of Jesus Christ has been at the center of what we do and why we do it. We love because God first loved us, and we serve because God's called us and allows us the privilege of joining him in his work. Rescue mission work allows us to share the hope and the good news of the gospel with people who desperately need it. So today we're going to divide our time into four parts, plus the time for Q&A. So first we're going to start with the crisis. Uh, We're going to talk about facts and statistics along with some of the root causes of homelessness today. And then second, we're going to touch on God's perspective, his heart for marginalized people. Third, we're going to talk about the missions approach. We're going to define um, our program model, which is broken into four key stages, survival, stabilization, recovery, and post-graduation. We're going to dig into those and what they mean for what we do as a mission. And then fourth, we're going to talk about how to impact, how, how the church can get engaged in impactful ways uh, with our homeless neighbors throughout the community. Again, this idea that we want the church to have a gospel response to homelessness. So let's just jump into this first section, the size of the crisis, right? The numbers are changing all the time, but according to the uh, the, uh, 2020 and 2022 reports from All Home King County, now known as the King County Regional Homeless Authority, previously known as, uh, I don't know, some other name, it keeps changing with each generation of of administration, but it's always the same organization, kind of an umbrella organization. There's a, a count that goes, that happens once a year across the country called the Count Me In Report. In all the major cities across our, our country, we do a, a count of the homeless in that community. And according to the report for 2020 and 2022, uh, the, the newest report isn't out yet, so I can't give you the most recent numbers, but this is what we know. There are 13,368 homeless people. So Dennis, if, if you would just click one button at a time, it'll a uh, little amber alert on our phones. Uh, if you just click the button, it'll take us through these numbers. 13,000 plus homeless in Seattle King County, 7,000 or about half are un- unsheltered. More than 1,000 are families with children, and about 1,000 are youth and young adults. It's a pretty significant crisis. Uh, Seattle, three numbers that might be uh, interesting as far as understanding the context of these numbers. Seattle is the 18th largest city in the nation by population. Yet we have the third largest number of homeless people after only New York and Los Angeles. 
And so when you do the math per capita, we have the number one density of homelessness in the nation. Uh, so when you drive around and you live your life and you think to yourself, homelessness is growing, and that you see it more than you used to, that's because you do, because that's a reality, and that's the truth of our community. One note that we do would say is from that report, and you can find that if you just Google count me in report, you can read the reports that the, all Home King County puts out. Uh, in that, there's their survey done among uh, our homeless neighbors, and uh, only about 5% report from being out of state before they became homeless. Um, by and large, our homeless neighbors are actually our homeless neighbors. Um, they, they are often close to wherever they grew up. Whatever city in the county happens to be the city they grew up in, that's typically where you'll find them. Um, but what we know is that homelessness is growing. If you look at this slide here, in the year 2000 on the bottom left, we had about 6,900 according to the official count. But by 2022, we're at over 13,000. So we've almost doubled in 20 years uh, here in our community when it comes to homelessness. So the homelessness crisis is very visual to, to our lives here. But, you know, one of the things that we like to talk about is, is typical ways people respond to the crisis. Over and over, we have seen people respond to homelessness and people struggling with it in a couple of different ways. One is a get-a-job mentality. Anybody ever heard of the get-a-job mentality? Anybody ever said, don't you raise your hand? This is rhetorical. Anybody said get a job already, right? Right? So what does it look like? This response kind of goes along the lines of, hey, why don't you just get a job? Right? Or stop panhandling and pull yourself up by your bootstraps to make something of your life. Some variation of this. People with this reaction tend to stress personal responsibility as the answer to the homeless crisis. Personal responsibility is important, and it plays a role. But it falls short of addressing the root cause of homelessness. Another reaction is the give them a home mentality. Uh, most of us have probably heard this in some variation. Uh, it, it goes something like this. Society has failed this person, and we've been so blessed and privileged it must have come at this person's expense. And people with this reaction tend to believe that society should save them. Humanism and the basic goodness of people will solve the homelessness crisis. And again, society has a role to play, but by itself, it can never address the root cause of homelessness. We also try to make sense of the crisis by saying it's an economic problem. Uh, certainly, there are economic factors, right? However, think about this. If most people in this room, just take a look around the room. If most people in this room experienced a catastrophic health issue, lost a job, couldn't pay the rent or the mortgage, um, you know, something went terribly wrong, like, would we end up homeless? Would you and I in this room end up homeless, do you think? Probably not. Probably not. And why is that? Because many of us have relationships, you have a relationship with family members, with, with church families, with friends, with neighbors you've lived next to for decades. People are going to help you. You have a network of people who are going to help you in a difficult time in your life. We would probably have a place to stay. So we've got to not give in to the temptation to say that economics are the root cause of homelessness. Homelessness, this might shock you, homelessness is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. All right, let me say that again. Homelessness is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. If you simply provide a home to most homeless people, the problems will linger. But if you dig deeper and address the root causes, the symptoms of homelessness will go away. How do we know? Well, one, it's based on God's design for people. And two, we've seen it firsthand over the last 92 years. We know that it's true because of the way that God has worked in people's lives. So some of the symptoms of, of homelessness, are, uh, homelessness are clear, right? Addiction, mental health issues, abusive relationships, chronic illnesses, poor housing and living conditions. But if these are only symptoms, what are the root causes of homelessness? Well, we believe broken relationships and trauma are at the root. Broken relationships with God and with others. Homelessness is more of a relationship issue than a resource issue. Remember I said before that we at the mission have taken a more relational approach to loving and serving our homeless neighbors in recent years. This is the why behind that shift. Broken relationship. We're pursuing relationship with our homeless neighbors. I also mentioned trauma. There was a fascinating study that was begun in 1997 by the Center for Disease Control, and the study gave us what we call today the ACE test, 
with eighths standing for adverse childhood experiences. Some of you may be familiar with the ACE test. Some of you may have even taken it yourself. The question is, what does it have to do with homelessness? Well, in the study, it was discovered that traumatic events in childhood can have negative impacts on people in their adult years. These traumatic events are categorized in three areas, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. Uh, the, 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 the test or the quiz or the, the inventory basically came up with 10 simple yes or no questions. The number of questions a person answers yes to determines his or her ACE score on a scale of 0 to 10. And the questions include whether or not you've experienced physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, whether you've experienced physical or emotional neglect, and then this num number of household dysfunction issues around mental health, mental illness, incarceration of a relative, domestic violence, substance abuse, divorce. And the researchers discovered, and it's been confirmed over and over since the study began, that generally speaking, the higher a person's ACE score, the greater the risk that person uh, experiencing various types of dysfunction as an adult. For an example, if you have an ACE score of 7, you're 30 times more likely to attempt suicide as an adult. And the level of dysfunction starts increasing rapidly as, at a score of just 3 or higher. And a high score does not have just an effect on one's mental or emotional well-being, but it can impact physical health as well. Childhood trauma impacts the whole person. A high ACE score relates or correlates, right, it's not a cause, it's a correlation, uh, with increased chances of obesity, diabetes, stroke, heart attack, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, all of these different things that there's correlation between this childhood trauma experience and what happens and what you experience when you're an adult. So the question today, right, is how does the ACE test and the ACE score, and how does trauma relate to homelessness? Well, studies show that if you have an ACE score of four or more, you're more than 16 times more likely to experience homelessness. And if one of those four is sexual or physical abuse, you're 32 times more likely to experience homelessness. In fact, for every increase of one in your ACE score, you're 16% more likely to become homeless. So if you do the math, a significant correlation between a high ACE score and those who are experiencing homelessness. Several years ago, we did an informal survey of, of the men in our addiction recovery program where we asked them to take the ACE test. Now, of those 30 or so men who, who took the test for us at that time, their average score was a 9. Yeah. Puts in perspective a little bit of the crisis in our community and, and really getting to the heart of, of the cause, broken relationship and trauma as the cause for, for why we have a homelessness crisis. But we're going to talk a little bit about God's perspective. And we learned from the ACE study that homelessness for many isn't simply a matter of economic hardship or a lack of affordable housing. It isn't just a matter of addiction. These are all symptoms of a much larger issue, the issue of personal brokenness often resulting from that childhood trauma. And one of the things that we do offer beyond this 101 class, this is the beginning of a series of classes that digs deeper into these topics on mental illness, on trauma, on addiction, and what is the church's role for those who are experiencing those things. But for today, as Christians, none of this should surprise us, right? God's design for children to be, is for children to be raised in a healthy environment by parents who love them and treat them as the precious image bearers of him that they are. When dysfunctional relationships bring trauma into a child's life, the child's unable to develop as God intended. Just as dysfunctional relationships lead to adult dysfunction, it's only in right relationships that healing can occur. This is a really critical piece to everything that we're going to talk about today. Just as dysfunctional relationships lead to adult dysfunction, it's only in right relationships that healing can occur. So if we want a person to heal, simply making housing affordable, helping them find a job, or helping them stop abusing substances won't solve the root cause. We have to and we must address the root cause, broken relationships. And we're going to help to bring right relationships into their lives, to help them to know they have a Heavenly Father who loves them deeply and wants to be in relationship with them. We're going to help them recapture what was lost, and we're going to help them see and believe that they're made in His image and that they're precious to Him and to us. The answer to healing from broken and dysfunctional relationships is found in Jesus we receive our true identity in him, and then we live out that identity in the context of relationships within communities of faith, or what 
the Apostle Paul calls the family of God, which is a group of people who are seeking to love God and to love others. That's us here today, Cascadia Church. We're the family of God. We're not like a family. Scripture tells us we are a family. So today we want to share a few stories. You can imagine how complex these issues are and how deeply rooted uh, the pain can be for those who've experienced these things. We asked Johnny, Steph, and Paris if we could tell them, tell you their story. Take a look at what have they have to say about their experience. My mom and dad split up um, about the age of 11. When I actually got jumped into my gang neighborhood, it was probably about 12 years old. From the sixth grade to the time I turned 18, just personally, I witnessed 23 of my friends get murdered in front of my face. I became homeless in the wintertime, like in December 14th, 2014. It was freezing that winter. I remember I would leave my tent during the day and then come back during the evening, and it was literally like opening a freezer up. It was, it was horrible. My family life was really dysfunctional. So when I was uh, 14, I was raped by my uncle. Even though he had raped me, I felt ashamed of what happened, like I was the bad one. I was like 14 years old, and this man was 52. It changed the entire trajectory of my life. Our family completely changed. It was like destroyed almost immediately. Like the kids, started being neglected right away. My husband was gone. The kids were gone. I was on drugs, sitting there, looking around, and I was like, this is it. This is the end. They would have fights in the bedroom, and my mom would, like, tell us to go get our neighbor, but then we wouldn't be able to leave because my dad would block the door. I was, like, seven or six, and I didn't really know, like, what was going on, and I didn't understand that, like, you know, drugs and, like, alcohol, like, what they really did. So it was like, well, I'm the big sister, so now I have to take on this responsibility since my mom and dad aren't here. It's my turn. Like, I, it just felt really lonely. What do people need in order to get out of this kind of life and to start live thriving, living thriving lives? Well, as you know, it's a multifaceted problem, and the solutions are multifaceted as well. Now, they have physical needs that need to be met, and they have relational needs that need to be met, and they have spiritual needs that need to be met. And we want to talk about how God's perspective on the homelessness crisis helps to meet those spiritual needs and, and the others as well. As followers of Jesus, we need to look at all of life through the lens of a biblical worldview. We need to look at life's issues in light of the gospel. I can remember my connection to understanding God's eyes for the world and the hurting and the hopeless on a mission trip at 17 years old in Guatemala City, standing in front of a small classroom of kids who lived in a shanty town outside the city dump. They're in this little schoolroom run by some missionaries, all uh, supported by sponsor similar to World Vision Child Sponsorship. And the missionary saying to us for the 30 kids that were in front of us in this first grade classroom, when we asked, how many of them need sponsors? And he said, all of them. And we as a youth group, six of us from our youth group with our youth pastor, we picked one child. His name was Raul, sat in the front row in the center desk. Why Raul? Because he was there. How do you choose? Broke my heart that we had to choose. We couldn't support all of them, so we chose to support one. We wanted to do for one what we wished we could do for all. And that moment, standing there when that missionary said all of them, they just crystallized for me that every life matters, right? Everyone is created in the image of God, and every life matters. Having God's heartbeat and understanding and having his eyes to see the world changes everything about how we engage as believers. See, God's design for the world and for people is good, very good, in fact. He created people to live in perfect relationship and perfect community with him and with others, with the created world, and, and ultimately with ourselves. But we know this, sin came into the world and marred God's good cre creation, and as a result, we have broken relationships with God and with others and with the created world and with ourselves. And broken relationships often lead to broken lives. In the Old Testament, 
Certain classes of people became marginalized, in particular widows, orphans, and foreigners. Because God loves people, he called his people Israel to make provision for marginalized people, to seek justice for them. And today we believe we're called to do the same. There are few people more marginalized in our city than those struggling with addictions and mental illness, living in tents and under overpasses, our homeless neighbors. So in light of all this, what should our response be, right? What would be a gospel response? Well, we believe any gospel response must begin with prayer. We need to get on our knees and ask God to give us his eyes and his heart for our neighbors, for our homeless neighbors. We need to ask him how he wants to use us, if at all, to meet their needs and to show them his love for them. And we need to be mindful that if God does not send us, then we should not go. We must remain sensitive to the Spirit's call on our life. So prayer is a gospel response. Next, we need to recognize our own brokenness. We're all sinners in desperate need of a Savior. We need to see that it's only through a restored relationship with Jesus that we have anything good going for us. That's a gospel response. Making provision and seeking justice for marginalized people as God calls us and called his people to do is also a gospel response. Jeremiah 29, 7, God tells his people Israel to seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which they were exiled and to pray for it because if it prospered, they would prosper too. And God wants his people to prosper and he wants cities to prosper. So seeking the peace and prosperity of the cities, therefore, is a gospel response. In Matthew 25, we read about the sheep and the goats. God's sheep are those who cared for the least of these among them. So loving the least of these is in our DNA as children of God. Are we doing that? Doing so is a gospel response. Jesus, Jesus also told us in Luke chapter 10 that if we're, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then he tells the story of the Good Samaritan I'm sure we're familiar with. The Good Samaritan story teaches us, among other things, that our neighbor is not necessarily someone we would normally associate with. Our neighbors are hurting, and our neighbors are hungry, and our neighbors are homeless, and Jesus says we're to love them as ourselves. That is a gospel response. When we interact with our homeless neighbors, we're called to do so in such a way that affirms God's design, his good design for them. Remember, God created humanity in his image. And when we look into the eyes of our homeless neighbors, we need to see them as image bearers, and we need to treat them as such. That's actually a gospel response. When we interact with our homeless neighbors, we need to listen to their stories. As we learn people's stories, we often find points of connection, common interests. The Holy Spirit begins to knit our hearts together with theirs. He begins to give us compassion for them. Allow this to happen and then act on it. That's a gospel response. I'm going to ask you to take a moment to look at the screens. When you do, you're going to see the montage of faces. There's no music. There's no background, backtrack, it's just images. When you look into their eyes, I'm going to ask you to see Jesus in them. See them how God sees them. Take a look at this. It'll go on its own. When we meet a homeless person, we need to remember that they need our attention, and they need our affection, and they need our affirmation, just as God gives each one of us. We want to talk about the mission's approach, but before I do, I want to define who we see ourselves as, as at the mission. Uh, we see ourselves as followers of Jesus who love and care for our homeless neighbors throughout the greater Seattle area. That's it. Nothing fancy. Right? Just a bunch of Jesus followers who share a mission and a calling and a love to serve our city in this way. And we do it by addressing the root causes of homelessness, breaking the cycle of homelessness by meeting urgent physical needs, building relationships, offering long-term recovery programs. 
and our efforts to work and restore dignity and help move people to healthy, thriving lives is working. We do this because we want everyone to know that no matter their circumstances, they are loved and cared for by God and by us. And so we have certain guiding principles that we live by at the mission. Here's four that we just want to share with you as a part of this training today. One, we believe everyone is made in God's image and deserves dignity. We believe that God desires to be in a personal relationship with us through Jesus Christ. We believe homelessness is not a permanent state and that change is possible. And we believe that people are wounded in the context of relationships and that it's in the context of relationships that people find healing with God and with themselves and with others. And so our program, as I mentioned before, is broken up into four areas, survival, stabilization, recovery, and post-graduation. You can see the flow from left to right, how the process works. Let me just dig in for a moment to describe each of these for you. On the next slide, we're going to see, we're going to talk about survival, how we love and care for people who are living on the streets, often in the midst of their addictions and mental health crisis. Some of the programs that, we, that are included in our, in our survival stage of, of outreaches is our outreach team. During the day, we have teams that are out on the street, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., five days a week, engaging with our homeless neighbors. Search and rescue, that's the same team of people, but at nighttime we call it search and rescue because what we do on the streets is a little different from what we do during the daytime. I'll explain that in a minute. We offer meals. We have a mobile shower trailer. Uh, I'm telling you there is nothing that gives dignity more than having a hot shower and a fresh set of clean clothes. Um, it just it is amazing what it does for a person to make them feel real and human and loved. Um, we have mental health outreach. We have team members who are certified mental health counselors who serve with us on our outreach team. During the daytime, they do a lot of mobile case management, helping people get resources around mental health and connect to that. We do pet support. As you are probably aware, many of our homeless neighbors have pets. Because they have pets and they love their pets, we love them too, and we bring pet supplies with us on the van so that not only are they getting food for themselves, but they're getting food for their pets. One way of us to be able to say we love them. Survival is all about us showing up. It's a, a, it's a Jesus model. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son, that God came to us. He loved us before we loved Him. We want to go out and meet them and build a relationship with them. We want to go to them just in the same way the Savior came here to build a relationship with us and show us the kingdom way. And in survival, we're out there and we're leading with learning their names and learning their stories and sharing the good news of the gospel, praying for people, introducing them to Jesus. In fiscal year, August, uh, September 1 of 2022 to August 31 of uh, 2023, 647 people who gave their lives to Christ on the streets of Seattle and King County. Many of them connected to local churches, many of them coming into our programs, but we're actively sharing the gospel with those that we meet. And the food and the water and the blankets and the things that we give out at the back of our van are all bridges of building relationship with our homeless neighbors. And the invitation to come in off the street to a shelter, to come into a bed and start a process of recovery, to be on a pathway of what we call a pathway to restoration, to be able to have a thriving life. So in the invitation to come in, when they come in, they come into what we call stabilization. That's number two. Here we love and care for people uh, by helping them get out of their current environment, environment and giving their bodies and their minds time and space to recover from the impact of addiction and living on the streets. It helps them to get to a place where they're what we call program ready, meaning that they're in a posture to experience real change in their life. They, in stabilization in the emergency housing and in our Hans shelter, they are getting the opportunity to like move from living out of their survival brain, like i got to think about where I'm going to eat and where I'm going to sleep and how am I going to stay alive. Now they're resting. They have people around them who say, we love you, and we're showing it, we're demonstrating it, we're walking alongside with a counselor and a case manager and a team of people who are helping them think through what would be the journey that I could go on to leave that life behind. They're eating regularly with good, nutritious food. They're sleeping. They have showers every day. They're in the safety. They have a community of others who are on a journey as well. And the whole idea here is, is to help them to take a next step. 
So we offer as a part of this work therapy, daily Bible study, community groups. We have a really active prison ministry. Many people in prison have opportunity to come and be with us in our program. We have one-on-one -on -one case management, chemical dependency assessments, mental health assessments, weekly church attendance, 12-step classes, and so much more. That's just all a part of stabilization. And in this 30, 60, 90 days of stabilization, the invitation is to step into a one-year recovery program. And that happens at several of our properties, Hope Place, uh, in the Othello District, Capitol Hill Men's Recovery Program on Capitol Hill is all about those who have co-occurring diagnosis of substance abuse disorder and mental health disorders together. So there's mental health support at that location. And then Riverton Place out near the airport in Tukwila uh, is our one-year men's recovery program. And in recovery, we're offering people a whole year of engagement around a journey leaving behind homelessness. We do a thing called the Genesis Process. It's a 300-page workbook that basically strips away all the lies and myths they've believed about who they are, extinguishing the, the, their identity that's been fed to them by trauma and addiction and, and the lies of the enemy, and we rebuild it on the foundation of an identity in Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be a Jesus follower and to let him transform you from the inside out? There's so much that's a part of that recovery process. And at the end of that recovery journey, uh, they get to graduate, and that's post-graduation. We have a graduation. It's a pretty amazing experience. We'd love to invite you to come and be a part of that and, and to help cheer on and celebrate those, who, those who've recovered from this. But we love and care for people after they graduate from the recovery program. We want to help build relationships and engage them in local churches so that when they leave their chapter of their life with us, that they spend the rest of the chapters of their life in the community of God's family in the local church, in a place like Cascadia Church. Because what do we know? If they don't have a stable support system when they graduate, if they don't have healthy relationships with a community in place, they can very often end up right back where they started. It's vital that we address and help launch people into thriving lives beyond our recovery programs. And that's actually God's design. God's design is not for the mission and our recovery programs to be the place where people find community for the rest of their lives. His desire is for all of us to be engaged in a, in a church family. And so we want to invite the churches to, to be that kind of place. There are those who might say that by going out and giving out blankets and clothes and food and water to help people in their addictions, that we are simply enabling them. I've had that conversation in the last two weeks. But we have a saying that responds to that criticism. Yes, we know that blankets and clothing and food and water is not all that they need in order to escape their addictions and their troubles. But it's hard to meet someone's needs or to tell them about Christ when they're dead. It seems harsh, but it's actually true. We have to meet their physical needs in order to have an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. So does our approach work? We believe it does. The city of Seattle and most of the municipalities in King County believe that it does. We have regular conversation with them. Many of their approaches that have changed over the years have changed because of conversation with the mission. They see that what we do is successful. Currently, 66% success rate, two years post-graduation, clean and sober, permanent housing, permanent employment. That number is off the charts compared to any other organization that's doing work with our homeless neighbors. So many look to us as a trusted resource as they address homelessness and addiction here and across the country. Well, earlier we introduced you to three people whom God brought to us. You heard them share their stories and how they got to where they were. Let's hear the rest of their story and see what God did. I was happy to be out of the tent. I was willing to do anything they told me to do, so I did not go back to the tent. I started to feel like a person again. There was hope. So I'll go visit her every day. I would see like her rise, you know, and how much she was just like, like becoming a woman, you know, right from her very eyes. And I remember sitting there and she's sharing the, you know, the word of God and sharing the, sharing the program with me and this and that. You know, it was thinking to myself, like, dude, I want some like core brothers. You know, I want, I want like, some case management. You know, I would like, like, you know, have a devotion. My first 30 days of the mission was like, it was, it was, it was, it was beautiful and it was gut wrenching to me and it was um, probably the greatest moments of my life. God called me here for a purpose. He was going to make a way, but 
my way he gave to me through Whole Place. I had made these big signs. <laughs> I had everybody sign them. Because to me, it was like, welcome home to your mother kind of thing. I was learning how to be a mom all over again. A whole bunch of people were just like congratulating me and my mom on finally moving in together. I love Johnny now. He's the dad I don't have. I mean, he really is because he's my stepdad, but I'm just glad Johnny's here because I don't know what we would have done without him. I'm not just a drug addict, a person without a house. I'm, I, I'm mad or I'm somebody. I'm an individual in my life that, you know, someone cares about. The beauty of it is we keep going. We keep pushing forward, and we just and it keeps working. It does not work without God. Like there is no future, there is no hope. There is, if I'm not putting God first, there's all these things cannot be possible. There's always hope, my friends. There's always hope. The mission has captured hundreds of these stories that speak to to the life change that Jesus brings. Uh, you can find us on our mission website under Changed Lives, or you can go to our YouTube channel, Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. I mean, if you ever have a day where you're like, is God really at work in the world? Like, you have a blue day, you have a day where you're discouraged, seriously, fire up one of these videos and watch somebody tell their story about how their life was transformed. Uh, it'll inspire you to get up and get moving for another day to follow Jesus because he changes lives. Speaking of changing lives, we love to talk in this last section about how you can get involved. I think that uh, for every person who comes to a training like this, uh, we have a personal responsibility before the Lord. Me as an individual, what's my response to what I experienced, what I heard, uh, what God put in front of me? But then there's the, the response of the church. Like collectively as the family of God in this place, what does God want you to do and who does he want you to be in this community regarding our homeless neighbors and others who are hurting? And so we love to talk and hear about how you can get engaged and, and be a part of the God's solution for our homeless neighbors in the community. But before we do, we want to talk a little bit about what the mission can provide. Uh, the mission, uh, 92 years and counting, we're still learning, we're still growing, we don't have it all figured out. We're still trusting God to help us to be better every day, the thing that he's asked us to do. And part of my role at the mission is to equip and support the local church so that you all can do the thing that God has designed for you to do. And so at the mission, we provide awareness and insight to numerous issues. We're going to do a Q&A, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of your questions. We do these trainings, right, training on best approaches on how to engage. Um, we help to equip you and the church on how to best minister to homeless neighbors. This is just the beginning. After this, we do a class. Uh, we can offer a class on, on uh, addiction, mental health, and trauma. And then we sp specialize on just a class on trauma and just a class on addiction. And we have a class that's a nationally certified mental health uh, first aid, if you've ever taken CPR first aid, like the local fire station or American Red Cross, and you've been certified to help somebody who's having a physical medical event, the mental health first aid class is the mental health side of that first aid training. It's a long day. It's a, it's a nearly an eight-hour day of training, but it's, and it's, it's really great quality stuff that we're offering uh, to the community to help people be more aware of how to engage somebody who's having a mental health challenge. We have a number, number of other classes as well. Uh, we, we offer encouragement and coaching for whatever it is that God is calling you to do and how to engage. We help connect other churches uh, in federal way. There was a church that wanted to do street outreach. There was a church that I knew that was already doing street outreach. And I said, well, why, why, rather than reinventing the wheel, how about the two of you work together? So I introduced the two churches together, and now they're doing street outreach together up by, by the mall. Um, and now a third church has joined them, and, and they're working together as churches uh, all of them, churches similar in size to Cascadia. None of them are huge churches, but they've combined their, their people together on these Saturdays to go out and care for homeless neighbors, to learn their names and to pray for them, to bring resources to them, to help them to connect with the mission. And so one of the things we get the joy of doing is connecting some of those dots for, for churches in a community. So what can the church provide? Prayer. I've said that before, right? We've we got to be committed to praying. We're going to pray. You're going to pray. God's going to move. That's what we believe Scripture teaches us. Uh, we, we, we think that you can provide people who can love and who can serve, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute. Gospel-centered relationships where healing can take place. How cool would it be to see some of our homeless neighbors in Auburn and Federal Way land in your church community and be brought up in Christ and find hope and healing and a restored life because of relationships that this church could offer to them? Yeah, so much more. 
So what are some of the ways you can get involved? Well, there are a lot of ways a church can get involved. You can get involved personally. Uh, prayer is personally the, the first one, right? Just to pray. We have an online prayer meeting uh, twice a week. You can find that on our website under our volunteer page. Uh, you don't even have to come somewhere to meet with people. And We have a, a team member who hosts an online prayer room. So you can log in through the link and you can pray with others across the county who are committed to praying for homeless neighbors, kind of a guided prayer time. You can be a mentor, someone who, while in recovery and post-graduation, we want every guest to have a, a personal mentor, being available to listen to their story and build relationship and to provide a sense of community, um, to talk about Jesus and your journey with Jesus and to answer their questions and to help them to grow forward. And we provide all kinds of resources and training about how to have that relationship with somebody in our program. Um, volunteer with our search and rescue team. So you can go out with the vans and you can be on the street, on the front lines, meeting our homeless neighbors and bringing food and supplies and bringing the gospel and praying for people. And, and uh, if you think you're too young or too old, the answer is you're not. Anybody and everybody is welcome to come with us on search and rescue because God uses who he wants to use. And I'm telling you, it's a powerful experience. You can bring and serve a meal. We call this BAM, Bring a Meal, right? It's an acronym. Um, a bunch of years ago, our food service director said to the mission, hey, the number of meals is growing. Uh, I need more budget. And we said, we don't have more budget. You've got to figure it out. He literally went to his quiet place with a blank piece of paper and said to the Lord, Lord, I don't, I don't know how to solve this. We need more meals. We need more food. But we don't have money to buy it. How, do you, how are you going to solve this? And he literally prayed. And he took out his pen and he began writing. And he came up with this strategy led by the Spirit where he invited churches restaurants, families, individuals to prepare a meal and bring it to a program site to feed our people. And right now about 20, 22% of our annual food budget is covered through the Bring a Meal program. And more than bringing a meal, it's caused people in our community to become engaged with our homeless neighbors through the work of the mission. It's expanded our reach and relationship with those who care. So bringing meals, pretty fun. You can come to our kitchen and bring ingredients and prepare it in our kitchen. You can prepare it at this kitchen and bring it in. The only thing you can't do is you can't prepare it in your private home kitchen. That's actually a, um, a, a health department um, rule. Uh, but we can talk about that if you wanted to do it. It would be a great thing for a small group or even um, a, a family to do. You can teach classes at our recovery programs. We have a variety of classes that we offer. You can step into our curriculum. If you have a specialty, a thing that you want to provide for our guests to say, I think this could be a resource, call us. We'll talk us through what you want to do. There might be a place for you to come and teach a class at our recovery programs. There's donation drives where you do a drive here at the church that would help meet some of the needs that we have at the mission regarding uh, food and clothing and other things that we can identify as key needs for what we're doing on the streets and beyond. Uh, you can volunteer with us in a number of different ways, attending a graduation, building care packages, donating financially. There's so many ways that the church and the community can get engaged, and we'd love to talk to you about how that might be possible. So what we're going to do as we finish um, is I'm going to show you a video, and I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward because we're going to sing. Uh, I'm going to just use this video. It recaps uh, in a creative way uh, just kind of the story of what God's doing from survival to post-graduation. You're going to see the, the, the journey that, that our homeless neighbors are going on through the work that God's doing through Seattle's Union Gospel Mission. Um, and then as we come out of the video, I just want to let the, the worship team take us away with some songs. And then I think during Flock Talk, we'll do some Q&A. So take a look at this video as we wrap up. I might have to click on the center screen on that one. It doesn't always start on its own.
die. 